Hey, Cypher here. This episode is about the history of Hollywood, and it's quite a long one. But before we get started, this is part 9 of a long-running series about California history. While seeing the previous 8 is not necessary to watch this one, it is good for getting the big picture. See what I did there? <laughs> okay. So here's a link to that playlist. Anyways, on with the show. While the movie industry did not begin in California, it is now centered there. Hollywood took over cinematic production, and the state thereby became the cultural capital of the United States. But somehow, the industry remains very insular, a story unto itself that begins in a small New Jersey town, of all places. While there were many precursors, Thomas Edison's kinetoscope was the first commercially successful motion picture device in 1892. Along with their in-house filming technology and a studio called the Black Maria, Edison kept an iron grip on the patent for film. Soon, theaters and licensed production companies were sprouting up all over the place. Competing technology meant that Edison couldn't gain a complete monopoly, but he attempted to by merging several other companies to form the short-lived Motion Picture Patent Company in 1908. By then, one of the most popular genres of film were westerns. It made perfect sense considering that was the most popular form of fiction at the time as well. So the patent company and its predecessors sent agents to scope out where to film, since New Jersey wasn't the best location for most films, especially westerns, and California was perfect. The fact that the oil industry produced excess capital in SoCal certainly helped. Contrary to popular belief, Hollywood film production was not founded on escaping Edison's monopoly. Quite the opposite, actually. It was, in fact, founded by the patent company. While Edison agents had already filmed in California by the early 1900s, it took a member of the patent company completely moving to Hollywood to begin the trend. The Chicago-based company called Selig Polyscope Company moved to a Los Angeles district called Edendale in 1909. As more and more production companies moved to LA, they typically settled in the newly created, segregated neighborhood called Hollywood Land later shortened to just Hollywood. But the patent company had competition. A number of companies kept on coming up with creative ways to get around the patent law and make independent productions. Many created a bunch of legal trouble, and by 1915, the US Supreme Court ruled that the patent company was too monopolistic and ordered the breakup of the trust. It was a monumental change, and probably would have sent the film industry into a downward spiral if only an independent film company hadn't managed to produce one of the strongest performing hits Hollywood has ever seen that very same year. Birth of a Nation was truly the first blockbuster. It made more money than anyone thought conceivable, and had a huge impact on US culture, especially with the founding of the second Ku Klux Klan in its wake. The film effectively nationalized a southern myth called The Lost Cause, and an independent film company in Hollywood, under the leadership of D.W. Griffith, produced it. From 1915 onward, Hollywood was the center of the national culture industry. Other culture industries flocked there, from music recording to later television and even many YouTubers today. SoCal became the cultural capital of the US, perhaps best symbolized by LA's Capitol Records, which is now owned by a Hollywood film company called Universal Media Group. <laughs> which got its founding in 1912 New York before moving to California. But Universal was only a minor player in the industry after the success of Birth of a Nation and the breakup of the patent company. Five major companies formed in the 19-teens through the 1920s. They were Fox, Famous Players, later called Paramount, RKO, Warner Brothers, and Lowe's, who would later merge some holdings to form Metro-Golden-Mayer, or MGM for short. 
There were also two minor studios, who were Universal and Columbia. A final independent studio, meant for financing more imaginative works called United Artists, was formed in 1919 by D.W. Griffith, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks, all of whom were titans in the industry. These five majors, two minors, and one independent all formed what is called the studio system. They controlled the industry, not just by producing massive amounts of movies, which Paramount managed to do 220 in 1918, the most of any major studio in a single year, but they were vertically integrated too, where a company controls all aspects of the supply chain. Each studio had its own deals with theaters, explicit means of getting film to those theaters, and of course, made the movies themselves. These eight companies owned the means of production, distribution, and exhibition, limiting the ability of anyone else to enter the industry for three decades. So they could guarantee a certain amount of revenue through block booking, which meant that even if there was a dud of a film, it was bundled with others and theaters had to show the entire block regardless of each individual film's success. This led to a lot of films being pretty similar. They just pumped out content, with only a few movies really standing out. So instead of opening up the studio system, they relied on a cult of celebrities to sell their products. The star system, as it's called, made Hollywood actors sign with particular studios. They sold movies on the actors' names rather than the films themselves. Many banded together to create the Screen Actors Guild in 1933, which advocated strict guidelines on how those actors' names were advertised on marquees. In fact, Hollywood is one of the most heavily unionized industries in America, and the marquee guidelines are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to collectively bargained standards that affect films. Nonetheless, marketing functions the same way today, so celebrity worship is actually a strong form of manipulation for advertising purposes. With the studio and star systems, Hollywood functioned in a very predictable fashion. New technology was the major disruptor in the industry. Beginning in the late 1920s, synchronous sound changed production. I'm, when I'm abused or badly used, I always get my man. Actors either had to change their style, or some of them even lost their roles because of thick accents or squeaky voices. But talkies gained adoption just as an even bigger change swept the nation. The Great Depression began in 1929 and only got worse into the mid-1930s. But something Hollywood realized very quickly is that people wanted to escape from the problems of the Depression by going to the movies. The only other form of media people regularly turned to was radio, with many shows being produced in LA for that as well. That's why many people call cinema recession-proof. From already capturing the American cultural consciousness throughout the preceding decade, the Depression kept Hollywood in the spotlight. Soon, it came under a new kind of scrutiny. A nascent religious conservative movement targeted movies, saying they corrupted public morals. A professional association for studios, later known as the MPAA, formed in 1922, and to head off this issue, they started deploying their own censorship code. Its president was Will Hayes, so it's known by his name. But it was actually a group of people, most notably a Jesuit who imposed incredibly restrictive measures, like eliminating all homosexuality, miscegenation, or even too long of a kiss. Basically, films self-censored to avoid the possibility of federal censorship. The Hayes Code only began to be challenged in the 1950s and was abandoned in the 1960s, eventually replacing it with film ratings. But since the industry was recession-proof, they rode out the depression by making double features, where people could watch two films with one ticket. The second film in the set became known as B-movies, because they weren't the main attraction. B-movies later became a term for basically cheaply produced movies. This opened up a new avenue for Hollywood. They could diversify their film productions by having cheap and easily produced B-movies while having a few selected main features. Studios created mostly B-movies to tithe the proceedings over to bigger features. This also allowed them to start making more films in color. Though color photography predates cinematography altogether, it was prohibitively expensive. B-movies and vertical integration allowed Hollywood to take a leap in technology for their more major features. 
When the U.S. entered World War II, the L.A. culture industry was ready to jump into the war economy. Through federal subsidies, they went from standard production to wartime propaganda almost overnight. Yet two years ago, many had never fired a gun or seen the ocean or been off the ground. Americans, fighting for their country while half a world away from it. Fighting for their country, and for more than their country. Fighting for an idea. The military even worked closely with Hollywood to produce numerous films and documentaries, often under the Army's and Navy's name. Flushed with cash because of the war, afterwards Hollywood studios began taking greater and greater risks on high-budget films. The studio system was well off and were allowing for more stylistic filmmaking. Just before the war, the Western was given a new lease on life with Stagecoach, and musicals entered Technicolor Splendor the same year with The Wizard of Oz. Both Citizen Kane and Maltese Falcon released with incredible storytelling techniques and cinematography. This highly stylized filmmaking grew in power during the war, especially with some of the greatest propaganda documentaries ever made called Why We Fight. With the end of the war, Hollywood was poised to truly take advantage of their golden age. Before that could get fully underway, though, Hollywood reeled from a new catastrophe. In the 1948 decision U.S. v. Paramount, the Supreme Court ruled that vertical integration was a form of monopoly. The studio system immediately fell apart. Studios had to stop block booking and could only control production and distribution. Exhibition was free from studio control. This allowed for many other studios to start competing at the box office. A further blow came with the Red Scare. Numerous people were blacklisted from working on Hollywood productions simply for being suspected of communism. This signified a brain drain for the industry. And yet another significant blow was the advent of television. It became commonplace in American homes in the 1950s. Even though much of TV was produced in Hollywood, that still meant more competition. Cinema turned to spectacle in response. Epics and musicals dominated production budgets. Year after year, they got tremendous returns for these risks. Some of the greatest films of all time came from this bonanza, from Red River in 1948 to Lawrence of Arabia in 1962. But this wasn't sustainable. By taking risks, if one of these ventures bombed, it could pronounce the death of a genre. That came in 1962 with Cleopatra. It actually made a huge amount of money, being one of the best-selling films of the decade, but the budget was so high that studio execs considered it a failure. They kept chugging away at the old pattern throughout the 1960s, though. Didn't matter, the writing was on the wall. Epics and musicals eventually died as they became too unwieldy to finance. That whole style of filmmaking died with them. Hollywood collapsed under its own weight. This left room for a new generation of filmmakers to arise. Throughout the late 1960s and 70s, studios became willing to finance projects from upstarts. Most were baby boomers who grew up and grossed in Hollywood's golden age. These directors could synthesize B-movies and avant-garde trends with the cultural context of their day. New Hollywood addressed issues like civil rights and the crisis of confidence. As the frontier myth came tumbling down due to the realization of inherent problems with it connected to civil rights and glorified violence, so too did the Western genre, leaving room for much experimentation. Before this, directors were typically seen as part of the Hollywood machine, but in New Hollywood, directors became auteurs. Throughout the 70s, the film industry was very experimental, and three directors would define the coming age. Steven Spielberg brought back the blockbuster with pulpy and saccharine hits like Jaws or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Martin Scorsese showed that films could embrace this new cinematic language and still be successful with films like Taxi Driver. And the whole industry finally found its footing again with George Lucas's 1977 movie <laughs> Star Wars. Pop-infused genre flicks, especially science fiction, would dominate box office proceeds into the present. But New Hollywood had to deal with a new crisis, home video. Re-releases were a steady revenue stream for studios, but people were now able to buy the movie and watch it at home as many times as they wanted. Luckily, the blockbuster era was perfectly suited for this time. 
people were drawn to theaters to be up on the latest movie, rather than waiting for home release. But this created a new need for spectacle, much like the one that had ended the Golden Age. This time around, the rising cost of production hasn't imploded the industry, and that's actually through business innovations. In the 1990s, foreign revenue like the newly opened markets of former Soviet states and China became increasingly significant for Hollywood. Movies could depend on international proceeds to recoup the cost of production. So profits have ballooned, allowing them to grow the budget for films. Even when adjusted for inflation, in the list of most expensive movies, the first one from before 1990 is Cleopatra at number 26. Yet these movies keep making a profit thanks to globalization, even with the increasing cost of the spectacle. New technology like digital photography, projection, and computer-generated imagery has allowed productions to diversify that spectacle and sometimes deliver it with more efficiency. But ultimately, it is the money they can dump into production that matters most. As such, Hollywood has not only become the cultural capital of the United States, but the world. When the self-congratulatory Academy Awards began in 1929, it was to legitimize the prestige of Hollywood as the leader of the culture industry in California. Now, it is an expression of their global cultural hegemony. With these burgeoning profits, Hollywood reignited the key aspect of the studio system, monopolization. Studios keep merging or simply buying up each other, most notable of which is Disney. Though it waxed and waned throughout its existence, for instance having a renaissance during the 90s globalization boom, it was languishing in the early 2000s. Their excess reserves of capital came from theme park revenue, the first of which opened in 1955. With such a regular cash flow, Disney could afford to buy other studios and take great risks, perhaps best signified by the most expensive film to date. Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, which is a sequel film based on a Disneyland ride. They have acquired numerous other studios, including Marvel and Lucasfilm, and that's all a product of this new wave of Hollywood monopolism. Disney owns a great deal of theme parks, studios, and even television stations. With the financial backing of these major mergers, and as streaming from home replaced VHS, DVD, and Blu-rays, television entered a new golden age. The culture industry has never been so profitable, but some workers haven't benefited as much as others. While executives, producers, actors, and directors continue to see massive wage increases, the very thing they base all of this production on became neglected. But remember, Hollywood is a union town. So the Writers Guild of America went on strike in 2007. This virtually halted production of movies and TV for half a year. It was a huge hit to the industry, and though the writers gained greater attention and minuscule wage increases, their work is still underappreciated. As the Great Recession hit, Hollywood proved itself recession-proof again by continuing to make record profits despite burgeoning budgets and increasingly monopolistic business practices. The writer's strike ultimately had very little long-term effect. As I'm writing this, the industry faces another such closure. Unlike in 1918 when the Spanish flu ravaged America, yet Hollywood produced more films than they do today, production is halted by a global pandemic. What this means for the long term, who knows. Hollywood survived the writer's strike and the Great Recession just recently, but this time movie theaters are closed, which disrupts the production cycle from the opposite direction too. And since prediction is bound to fail, I shall refrain. In either case, Hollywood is still a juggernaut. It began with film production moving to take advantage of the Southern California climate and rapidly became the cultural nexus of the entire world. But that was not the only thing changing California history. Just like train advertisements before it, Hollywood changed people's perception of California. But there is so much more to the state than some neighborhood in Los Angeles. Next time, I'll be talking about how the Great Depression and World War II look different for California as opposed to elsewhere. At least if I ever get around to it, of course. 